Uh, so Rachel is just setting up the live stream. So um, if you're joining us in Zoom uh, from the, the event page, we also are streaming live to YouTube and LinkedIn, which is really exciting. Um, so we just have some things that, on our side that we need to get set up and, and give a few more minutes for folks to join and then, then we'll go, we'll get started. All right, Rachel says we already see it on YouTube. Awesome. Welcome if you're joining us from YouTube. All right, let me check. Oh, wow. Look, yep. Welcome, everyone. And I think that means we're also live on LinkedIn. So let me check LinkedIn here. Uh, awesome. We're live on LinkedIn. So exciting. Welcome if you're joining us from LinkedIn or YouTube too. Also, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. Um, city, country, myself, I'm in Oakland in the Bay Area. And um, yeah, I have to say it's like a nice day. It was raining last night. Um, but uh, Denny, where are you joining us from? Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, I'm joining from the, I believe cloudy. Yes, cloudy Seattle evergreen city uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest, hiding out here, so. Hey, I'm, I'm joining from Dublin, California, and it's raining quite a bit, so maybe we got the rain from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I have some family that's that's over there. Cool. And Ryan, where are you joining us from? Yeah, I'm calling from, from San Mateo, California, um, so a little on the on the west side of the peninsula. It's kind of cleared up a little bit here, but I think it'll nice. we'll get back to it in the afternoon. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. I went to um, elementary school in San Mateo. I'm uh, one uh, a local from the Bay Area, I guess you could say. Really, <laughs> not quite like too. San Francisco, <laughs> but like so. I grew up in Daly City, which is like a couple blocks. In, you know, some areas like a couple blocks over from San Francisco. But uh, yeah, cool. Yep, I uh, went to high school in Balboa Park, so I drove right by Daly City. Oh, okay, day. okay, yeah. nice. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> really. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have quite a few folks on Zoom already. <clears throat> I think maybe we'll give it like one more minute and get started here. Just have a few uh, quick slides to share. Awesome. Yeah, meanwhile, cool. it looks like there's a lot of folks that, uh, chiming in from all the place. I'm looking at India, Florida, Brazil, Italy, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, some other folks from Seattle, uh, Texas. Yeah, this is a great turnout here. Uh, we've got folks from New York. Brighton UK um, uh, over in Zoom as well. So I'm looking at LinkedIn and uh, let me switch over to YouTube. So yeah, it's we've got some really good turnout here. Right? This is awesome. Nice. Also in Zoom too. So Brighton UK and New York, welcome. And then uh, Buenos Aires, Alabama, Chicago, Costa Rica. Awesome. Some more folks from India, Peru. Cool. Really exciting. All right. Well, I let's get started here. Um, I just have a few quick slides that I want to share and welcome everyone. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us. This is um, a tech talk uh, with our folks, uh, our friends from Monte Carlo. So architecting for data quality in the lake house with Delta Lake and PySpark. And today we're uh, joining, joining us is uh, Pratik and Ryan from Monte Carlo. And uh, new this this time around, so we typically run our meetups on um, a meetup group, the Data and AI Online Meetup Group. And um, just recently, actually, our team launched a, a, a page on the Community Linux Foundation. And um, I'd love for you to join us there. So it's a virtual, it's our Delta Lake um, chapter there where we're going to host all of our community office hours and tech talks and all awesome content um, with the Linux Foundation. So there's the link there to join. I'll drop that in the chat spaces um, and uh, stay tuned of upcoming Delta Lake specific um, talks. And then also too, uh, we have, I'd love for you to subscribe on YouTube. We have a great tech talk and um, meetups playlist there where we record all of our sessions and they're all available immediately after the recording. And then um, follow us on uh, LinkedIn. We have a Delta Lake and um, a Databricks uh, LinkedIn page. 
And I wanted to do a quick call out because we have a conference coming up soon. It's the uh, Data and AI Summit. It's going to be hybrid this year, which we're really excited, um, in person and online at end of June, the 27th through 30th. Um, lots of awesome sessions. Um, the theme kind of is, you know, building the modern data stack on the lake, uh, on the data lake house. So hopefully you'll join us um, in person or online. And before I pass it over to Denny, my co-hosts and our speakers, I just want to remind everyone that the session is recorded and it'll be available on YouTube um, directly after we're done. So I'll drop that link in the chat. And then also too, um, we'd love to hear your questions and, and gather those while we're um, going through the presentation. So um, if you're joining us on Zoom, the q and is your best place. And then, you know, the chat is on for YouTube and LinkedIn and um, Denny and myself will be moderating that. So um, we'll, we'll capture your questions and answer as many as we can um, at the end. So with that, I'll pass it over to Denny. Thanks very much, Karen. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm not going to go ahead and do too much. I just wanted to reiterate two things. Uh, one is that please do ask your questions. We'll do our best to answer them live in LinkedIn, Zoom, or YouTube, all three, in fact, okay. Um, we're not gonna, there will be pauses during the session, so both Pratik and Ryan can go ahead and also chime in as well. But for the some of the other questions, we'll wait till the end of the session, so that way we'll allow the flow. Without further ado, that's it for me. I'm gonna go switch it over. Pratik, uh, Ryan, why don't you go to introduce yourselves and go uh, and start the show. Uh, we'll start with you, Pratik, I believe, so. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Dan and Karen. I'm Pratik Chavla, and I'm here with my colleague, Ryan Kearns, and we're the founding technical team members at Monte Carlo. So we're really excited to be here today, and we really wanted to thank the Databricks team and the Linux Foundation for this opportunity. And we're huge fans of both organizations and the broader communities they're building around, I think, some of the most innovative and important open source frameworks. What we're discussing today is what it takes to build, a, build and design a more reliable data lake and lake house using systems like Databricks, Delta Lake, PySpark, and data observability. But before we get started, let's just do some quick introductions. So like I said, I'm Pratik. I'm the founding engineer and technical lead at Monte Carlo, where I help drive the technical strategy for our data observability platform. Previously, I served as a technical lead at Barracuda, where I worked on email fraud prevention technologies. And I graduated summa cum laude with a BS in computer science from UC Santa Cruz. And of course, in my free time, as you can see from the slides, I enjoy watching Broadway shows, flying airplanes, reading, exploring new places. And I'll let Ryan introduce himself as well. Yeah, thanks, Pratik, and, and thanks to our host, uh, Databricks and, and the Linux Foundation for putting this together. Uh, so my name is Ryan. I'm one of the founding data scientists here at Monte Carlo. I've been for, for a little over a year and change. Um, I work on the majority of uh, anomaly detection, machine learning techniques for our platform. Um, prior to this, I was at Stanford, studied computer science and uh, philosophy with kind of a particular focus in natural language processing. Uh, and then before that, I've, I've worked at Afterpay in um, backend engineering, um, working on the data quality fundamentals uh, book with Monte Carlo, which will go into some of the concepts you'll see today um, in a sort of longer form uh, if, you're, if you're interested. And then my little fun fact is I'm a big fan of the American road trip. So I took a pretty beat up minivan across the country with some friends of mine when I was in high school and it remains one of my coolest memories. So um, definitely a big fan of that car. But uh, I'll pass it back to Pratik, who's going to get us jumping in right to the, the technical meat and details of the presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. And back to what you guys all signed up for. So we wanted to do like a walkthrough of common data quality challenges and how to solve them for the lake and lake house. So I'll just go over the agenda very briefly. On today's agenda, we'll basically imagine ourselves inheriting a data lake house. And um, it's a lake house environment specifically with a bunch of data reliability issues. And maybe you've actually all been in this position before. And then we'll talk about a new approach called data observability to solving many of these issues. And then we'll walk through what it takes to apply some of these principles and technological approaches to lakes and lake houses using Delta and all the other tools we have at our disposal. After that, Ryan will walk through anomaly detection by doing a demo using PySpark and MLflow. And, uh, and like um, Karen and Danny iterated, if you ever have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try our best to answer them. All right, so let's get started. So imagine you've joined a company as a lead data architect and you're inheriting a data lake environment. This one's built on Spark and Databricks, which is, I'd say, pretty exciting. Um, you, you can't wait to dive in and solve the new challenges and like work through all the thorniest data problems the company has. But the first one on your roadmap really is data quality. And this only came to light because uh, wonky dashboard was shared with your CEO and was projecting next year's financials, but it actually used last year's data. And 
Of course, that's not what you want to do. So the question is, how are we actually going to solve this? Before we dive in on how to like actually fix the problem and ensure it doesn't happen again, it kind of helps to understand the implications of bad data for stakeholders across the company. It's like the gift that keeps on giving, so to speak, and it works as you move downstream. And these broken pipelines can manifest in any number of ways, originating in buggy code, missing data, or even operational issues. So, and then even if, even no matter how you test, like the best testing, there's literally no way to catch all of them. So the key really is to monitor and alert on these data quality issues as soon as they happen and before they affect your stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are internal analysts or maybe your external customers. So here we put together this, uh, what, we, what we've deemed the data quality cone of anxiety. And I think it highlights a lot of these different levels of impact as data moves downstream beyond your lake house altogether. So you can see bad data can have serious ramifications. Like it, you can lead to lost revenue. It can lead to maybe erosion of trust. You can obviously waste your resources. There's just so many things that bad data can lead towards. It affects and it affects all different types of organizations. Like for example, with NASA, they had their they had their Mars Climate Orbiter. It was this is a multi-million dollar satellite, but it was lost because the software used to build this technology used a different measurement than the astronauts who used to program where it should land. I believe it was pound seconds versus metric units. They lost about $125 million in years and years of progress. And there's lots of other examples of this. Like for instance, there's a there was a $617 billion so and so quote unquote fat finger incident where a uh, trading error on the Japanese stock market happened where a broker just entered the wrong number and it caused like a huge stock fluctuation and the Japanese stock market was sent to rattle for a few hours. It was just a simple order for Toyota motor stock, but it was worth more than the size of like Sweden's economy. Um, so there's like that list goes on and you might not necessarily be risking, you know, $617 billion due to bad data quality. You can understand like, I think how the implications grow as your bad data flows downstream. So now the question that begs the question, how do we address this bad data? So we believe that you can learn a thing or two from our friends in software engineering. The problem of stopping bad data in its tracks can be tackled by relying on some of the best practices of like our friends in software engineering. Software engineers leverage these principles of site reliability, they use observability, and they use all this stuff to ensure that their applications are performing as expected and that uptime is high while downtime is low. So as organizations grow and the underlying tech stack powering them becomes more complicated, uh, for instance, let's say you're moving from a monolith to a microservice architecture, I think it's very important for DevOps teams to maintain a constant pulse on the health of their systems. And more specifically, at least we believe observability speaks to this need and refers to the monitoring, tracking, and triaging of incidents to prevent downtime. And as a result of this, like you're kind of shifting as an industry to more distributed systems. So observability engineering is really becoming really, really critical. So now if you look at it from, from our friends in software engineering, observability engineering really is broken down to three major pillars, as you can see on this slide. You have your metrics, you have your traces, and you have your logs. Now, what are these three things? So metrics refer to like a numeric representation of data measured over time. Traces are like the casually, casually related events in a distributed environment and logs are like a, the source of record for an event that took place. They have like a timestamp, they provide context and they basically indicate like an event occurred. But unfortunately, I think on the data side, I've noticed, and maybe you can empathize with this, that our approaches to data reliability and generally data engineering are eh, about 10 years or so behind that of software engineering. Because like in an application development, every team has like a solution already. They have a new relic, you have a data dog, you have pager duty, and we use all these really great tools to help measure the health of our application and ensure that there's some degree of reliability. Yet for some reason, like the data teams are completely flying blind. So, what if we can apply some of these principles to our data lake houses? So it kind of begs the question, what exactly is data observability? Well, if I think if you hadn't guessed already, it's kind of an organization's ability to fully understand the health of the data in their system. It kind of, uh, the data observability has eliminates like data downtime. And we kind of do this by applying the best practices of DevOps observability to our data pipelines. And like its DevOps counterpart, data observability uses automated monitoring, alerting, triaging, and we use all of this to identify and evaluate data quality and discoverability issues. And we think this leads to more reliable data, healthier pipeline, and hopefully more productive teams. So now what does this look like in practice? How can you actually, actually follow in the, these footsteps of these engineering friends that I've been talking about and apply these principles to your own data pipelines? 
In the next few slides, I'm going to outline a few of these best practices and hope my, my hope is that you can take that away from this presentation and apply it to your own systems. And just like how you have the three pillars of observability for software reliability, every data team has these pillars of data reliability. I've, I've broken them down into these five here, and we believe they're strong indicators of whether or not something has broken or gone wrong. So these five pillars are really freshness, distribution, volume, schema, and lineage. I'm going to walk through each one of them. So the first one is freshness. Um, Freshness kind of seeks to understand how up-to-date your data tables are, as well as the cadence at which your tables are updated. It's particularly important when it comes to decision making. As we all know, stale data is synonymous with wasted time and money. That was our first example, last year's data. Um, the next up on our, our next pillar up basically is distribution. And it's really, a, or, or you can say it's more like a function of your data's possible values. It tells you whether your data is in an accepted range. Data distribution gives you insight, I think, into whether or not the tables in your the, your, the tables in your data can be trusted based on what you expect from your data. Um, the, next, the next pillar is volume. So volume really refers to the completeness of your data tables and offers insight into the health of your data sources. Let's say you had 200 million rows and they suddenly turned into 5 million. I think you should know about that because that indicates something happened. The fourth of these is schema. So schema really is changes in the organization of your data. In other words, schema can indicate broken data uh, and monitoring who makes these changes to these tables is foundational to understanding the health of your data ecosystem, not to mention preventing, I think, some of these things from occurring again. And finally, we have lineage. When data breaks, I think the first question people always ask is where? Data lineage, I think, provides this answer by telling you which upstream sources and downstream instigators were impacted, as well as which teams are generating the data and accessing it. Essentially, I think lineage acts as their context. And it, kind of serves as a singular source of truth for all your data consumers. And you can see from my slide here, this is a DLT, which is from Databricks, and shameless plug. Um, so tracking these five pillars can give you a good sense of how healthy your data is. I think from there, whether or not a data downtime incident has occurred. Okay, so I've given you all this conceptual stuff. That's great. How do you actually use this? So in software engineering, we have we have what is known as a DevOps lifecycle. The DevOps lifecycle incorporates a bunch of distinctive continuous stages from like planning to coding to development to monitoring. And the cycle repeats itself. And while many of our techn technologies and frameworks have adapted to meet the standard and best practices we see in software engineering, I think we tend to handle data a little bit more reactively and it's prevented us from driving these changes in like a scalable way. So much in the same way DevOps apply the continuous feedback loop to improving software, it's, we believe it's time you can leverage the same blanket of diligence for data. So the data reliability lifecycle is kind of an organization-wide approach to continuously and proactively improving your data health. It eliminates data downtime by applying some of the best practices from DevOps data, uh, to, your, to your data pipelines. So we, hope, we think this framework will kind of allow you to be to hit a bunch of different key factors. One of them is you can be the first to know about data quality issues in productions. Then you can fully understand the impact of the issue and then fully understand where your data broke. But now let's actually dive into the environment. So if you recall, we inherited a lake house and to see if we can set up data pipelines for success when it comes to preventing like these billion, billion dollar data incidents. I think the first thing we need to discuss here though is what is really the difference between a warehouse and lake? Um, there's a bunch of different factors and a bunch of people have opinions on this, but I think it really boils down to the way data is stored and structured, as well as the various entry points you have in a lake that many warehouses don't. Uh, so I've kind of broken down the data lake into four uh, components or layers. The first of them being metadata, then you have your storage layer, then you have your query engine layer, and then you have your query logs layer. And as you can see from this slide, there are various technologies you can use to manage this. Um, and this is not even complete close to the all of them. And, but for the purposes of this presentation, let's dive a little bit into uh, building a reliable freshness detector with Spark and Databricks. But before we get to that, and I hand it off to Ryan, I wanted to briefly discuss all of these different layers. So the first one is your metadata layer. So like how warehouses have an information schema that provides like an extensive amount of metadata information about objects like tables and views, many lakes have uh, what is called a meta store and acts as a central repository for metadata. And there are many flavors of this meta store, but I'm going to talk about the three that work with Databricks. So you have your central hive meta store and every Databricks deployment has this and it's accessible by all of the clusters you use. You can also provision an external hive MySQL meta store, or you can leverage the AWS Blue Catalog. 
This latter is only of course available if you're using the AWS provider. And then for those of you who are using Delta tables, you can actually access the whole transaction log, which is the real source of truth and contains like an ordered record of every transaction that's ever been performed on a D D Delta Lake table. And Databricks is doing some great work to I think unify a lot of this with their upcoming Unity catalog, which you can sign up for the waitlist today. It's, it's, um, okay, so that's great. That's like, I just introduced a bunch of different technologies. What does that mean? And why do they actually matter? And why do you wanna crawl and track any of these? So I think doing so will let you cover actually three of the pillars that we talked about. By just, by just tracking metadata, you can get schema changes, you can get size, and you can get freshness. Well, to be fair, I think the last two have a little bit of an asterisk because they mainly apply to Delta tables, but schema can be tracked for any type of table. And what I mean by asterisk on this is freshness and size can be unreliable from the meta store and they only change in their respective catalog at certain circumstances. Like for example, how the data is loaded or maybe if you recently ran an analyze command or the type of table you're using. And in some cases, some of these catalogs just don't have all this information, but, but don't worry, there, there is a solution to that. And it's basically tracking it at the storage layer and I'll get into that right next. But I just wanted to mention one other really nice thing about the metadata layer is if you utilize the meta store, you can actually help, it can actually help you with lineage too. Um, for example, if you have a view that often contains the underlying view query, and you can actually use that to derive and build the upstream sources as well. Okay, so now at the storage layer. So by tracking the storage layer, what I really mean is follow, watching how the underlying data of a table changes. And this can be done in one of two ways, kind of regardless of what blob storage you're using. So the first one, and I think the most obvious one, is you can crawl the paths that correspond to a table. And this allows us to compute like the total size by just you know, summing up the files in the one or more directories that correspond to the table. Obviously, this is like, this for very large table, this can be very slow, uh, but you could, there are a couple of different optimizations that you can make. Like for instance, you can cache older partitions if you know that only new partitions are written to. And of course, like all resource problems, you can throw a compute at it till of course the day you can't. And then for freshness, if a file is encountered in the crawl, you know there's no freshness event, but if you haven't encountered one, you know something is up. Or you can do what I personally believe is a more is a more scalable and better approach, and you can just track files as they change and map these to a table. Uh, it's obvious. I think it's more scalable because it's push based, so you can bake this into your ETL tool or use a service like S3 Events if you're using that provider. Like on the on the left here, I have an example of S3 Events through EventBridge, and you can basically use this to track puts and deletes. And obviously this can only track new updates, but if you need to get a history, you can always bootstrap and create the baseline as needed. So the next layer we have is query logs. Query logs is a very important layer because it can be used for multiple different purposes. First and foremost, it can act as an audit trail and you can do things like track if a query has changed during a data incident. So this can help you with RCA. Um, you can also use it to help build lineage by creating like a source to destination relationship by just parsing these queries. And then for cases where the query logs are not available, which are some of the cases when you're using Spark, different Spark environments, uh, you might be able to extract the same information from the ETL tool you're using or even using a Spark extension like Spline. Um, and then there's a lot of other information you can find in the query logs in this context. Like for example, if you had the runtime available, you can analyze, let's say if your queries are degrading over time, or let's say you have tables that don't get frequently run queries or specific fields that don't get uh, run frequently, you can either clean them up or move them to a slower yet cheaper tier of storage if you're using a cloud provider. And the last layer we have here is the query engine. So via the query engine, I think you can execute more specific or custom data checks. This includes things like running field health, which covers like you can get null rates, unique rate, percent none, so many different versions of that. You can also do distribution, which covers like values with low cardinality tables to like determine if something significantly changed. Like if you had something tracking different clients like iPhone or Android, if a new client shows up, maybe that wasn't expected. And then obviously with the query engine, you can kind of write any SQL queries. You can validate whatever type of business logic you want. You have some custom thresholds that you know that have to be hit every day. You have SLIs that you want to write. Whatever you want to do, you can, you can write any sort of custom query and validate that. And these type of things can be built into your pipeline to stop or circuit break. As you can see here on the right, it's an example of one of our uh, Airflow providers where we basically have an operator that's sitting in the middle of your ETL pipeline that checks the data integrity or quality of, a, of of your table before it goes on to the next step in the pipeline. Or you can be notified after the fact, and then you can be you can use all this information and context you have to triage it. And just an important thing about after the fact, you just you need the necessary tools to RCA and determine impact. But you can use all of these things to kind of build like a holistic picture of what's going on in your data environment. Okay, so now I've kind of walked through some of these components. I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague Ryan, and he's going to demo how to actually build one of these monitors using uh, your Lakehouse with Python and Spark and PySpark. 
Great. Thanks, Pratik. I think I'll take over screen sharing in a sec. Um, for the moment, uh, while we're in this transition point, are there any any questions we want to raise about the last couple of sections, Denny? No, no, no current questions right now. Uh, we've actually answered most of them. I, I did want to call out that for any folks that are asking Databricks specific <laughs> questions, let's go ahead and leave them in the community form, uh, the Databricks community form, uh, community.databricks.com. <laughs> that, that's the great place for that. We definitely want to discuss much more about the about the topic that we're here today to talk about, okay? So about architecting data quality. So let's go ahead and definitely focus on that here. But pl uh, please, if you have any other questions on that, go ahead and chime in and uh, we'll continue answering them. And also, of course, answer them um, uh, post uh, Ryan's demo. So that's it for me, at least. Great. Thanks, Denny. Here, I'm going to share a screen now. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at Databricks in, in just a moment, if you can stick with me. Um, so. I wanted in, in the second part of this presentation to sort of get our hands dirty, um, take a look at um, at PySpark itself, at the Databricks environment, and you know look at uh, now that we've been given kind of a, a great overview of all of the conceptual tools you have at your disposal when trying to tackle um, a data observability campaign. You know how can you actually go about implementing that in some code in some way that sort of respects the constraints of the lake environment and the particular. Um, features that you have at your disposal, say in Databricks. So um, we'll be doing a, a short exercise in, in a, a Databricks notebook in PySpark. Uh, I'll look through some sources of data. They're gonna be a bit sort of fanciful and construed, but you'll have to work with me and, and you can extrapolate uh, into your environment here. Um, we'll do some feature engineering on that data to get a sense of um, how you might configure it for better detection. Um, and then we'll look at specifically the case of freshness anomaly detection. So that is um, detecting updates to tables or rather tables that skew from their typical update patterns. Um, at the very end, we'll, we'll give a brief kind of indication of how you would do some sort of model tracking, experiment tracking, um, and uh, uh, general kind of uh, parameter search, grid search with MLflow. Um, but I'll have some important points about the limitations of, of that technology in this case, and kind of invite you to think about some, some future directions that you could take. Um, also just plugging here, you'll notice that there are some GitHub links on this slide um, to our repository. We've been doing these kind of demonstrations for a little while, and we've actually got a sort of IPy notebook format that utilizes the same concepts, but in raw SQL and SQLite, um, using some pandas and some plotly for visualization. So all open source um, stuff. And if you're interested in, in kind of seeing this in a more kind of ubiquitous domain, feel free to take a look. So what I'll do is I'll get myself over to Databricks here, um, making sure pretty you guys can check out my, yeah, my presentation. Yeah, so architecting for data quality in the lake house, I'm now in, um, a notebook environment, I'll be writing some Python and just sort of importing some, some base libraries for, for handling this task. What I'm going to be using is I'll be leaning heavily into this new command that, that Delta Lake tables support, which is called describe detail. So if I just sort of capture um, diamonds, as you may be familiar, is a, uh, is a demo table in, in um, uh, the Databricks environment. I can describe detail on this table and actually get some information, including its unique identifier, its name, uh, where it's located, and then for our purposes here, when it was last modified. Um, you'll notice, as, as Pratik said, that I could get all this information directly from kind of the, the query history, uh, so the transaction log of this table. Uh, for the purposes of, of, of this demo, I'm actually only working with describe detail for reasons of scalability, which I'll explain. So if I uh, can just sort of post process on uh, this describe detail command. You'll notice I can get some last modified timestamp and some measured timestamp, which is just the current time. Um, and what I would do if I was uh, architecting for a, an observability platform here is I'd have some you know update times table, and I would use uh, the PySpark data frame format to write into that table a batch of these uh, last modified timestamps. Um, what I get to do here is since uh, a describe detail, just a describe command is so uh, cheap in terms of scale, 
I could run this on many tables in my environment and just get a sense of when they've all updated and then tack that information to the back of a um, kind of a, a growing incremental model, uh, maybe using like um, ELT or some sort of uh, orchestration scheduling service. I could get a sort of growing log of, of all the last modified timestamps uh, at, at pretty easy scale. So you'll notice, obviously, we won't be working with the real data from Diamonds. This table hasn't been updated since 2020. Um, so it is a demo table in the Databricks environment. So I sort of cheated and I created some synthetic data that would respect you know, uh, this workflow had we been recording data um, for about the last two months, so the last 60 days. And so if I run on this update times uh, table, you'll notice I've got four tables now. Uh, as I said, we can kind of scale this up. I've got diamonds, but also emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. And then since you know mid to late February, I've got when we modified those and when we measured them. Uh, and the measurement is, is sort of just an augmented feature. It's not strictly necessary for understanding how tables update, but it does give you a sense of how up-to-date your own uh, orchestration system is running. So if you have delays on your end, maybe you want to um, learn that that doesn't uh, necessarily indicate an anomaly in the freshness of the actual table. Um, but those are sort of nuances. I also just want to showcase um, if the actual uh, Delta table format's not for you, that you can load the exact same data either in CSV or JSON, if you're more familiar with in your data science uh, workflow, working with these types of formats, um, the, the lake environment sort of extensible to a large number of formats. Um, and so you can, you can see that I get the exact same data here, the same schema. So I've got, like I said, four table names. I've just been running describe detail and I've been, I've been tacking the results onto an incremental table. And I can identify these tables with unique IDs and sort of see when I measured them and when they updated. So now um, I'll do a bit of, of SQL uh, kind of wrangling on this table. Uh, you'll notice that in order to plot this, I'm just gonna kind of catch a ones column as my value. And I'm gonna get the measured timestamp and the modified timestamp. Uh, I'll take the first 400 points. This table is actually around 6,000 rows, but for the purposes of this demo, we're going to stick with a kind of constrained uh, group of just the Ruby's table updates. Of course, this uh, notebook will be open sourced and you can come in and, and mess around with all sorts of stuff. If you'd like to examine the correlations between tables, I, I put some stuff into the scripting to set them up. But if I just run some plotly visualization to get a sense of these updates, um, what you're seeing here is an update time series. This is um, your kind of base uh, feature set for anomaly detection. You'll notice if I hover over these, you see like at February 20th, we had an update. We had another one uh, five hours later, and then another one seven hours after, after that, or nine hours after that. Uh, so we've got a bit of a, uh, uh, what, what seems to be a, a semi-regular update cadence, although there seem to be um, many delays and probably some, some probabilistic updating based on whether new data is available. So this table is not perfectly accurate, um, yet uh, it does observe a sort of regularity. And you'll notice like specifically here, I'm pointing at a very large delay of around two days. So if we're using this table for um, dashboarding purposes, or we're, we're feeding the results into an ML model that runs live in production, uh, this may be fine. You know, we, Maybe we can tolerate a delay of roundabout um, 20 hours, maybe one day. Um, two full days seems to be quite a lot. And we may want to identify this anomaly here, this anomaly in the table's update cadence. And I'll sort of show how we can do some really naive uh, anomaly detection to, to surface that result. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is a form of a bit of feature engineering. Um, and of course, for those in the, in the, machine learning world, feature engineering can get a whole lot more nuanced than this. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give you the minimal uh, minimal augmentations, and then you can sort of infer all of the fun directions you would take this on your own. Um, so what I did is I just I added a uh, Lambda function. I assigned a new column. 
that just takes the last modified timestamp and subtracts it by the shifted timestamp. Um, so this intuitively gives you the delay between in incremental updates. And you'll notice if I sort of, I can scroll between these two and you'll see that dependent on the size of the gap between updates, the corresponding bar is larger because this records the number of seconds since the table was last updated. Um, so we've got like kind of a little regularity here. It doesn't seem like we eclipse something like 80,000 seconds all too often. And then we've got the spike at around 150,000 seconds. So visualized like this, it's not quite so clear that the anomaly is all that significant, but if we're looking in terms of its delay time, it can sort of get a, uh, a more nuanced understanding, a more obvious understanding. So I'm gonna show you some really simple unsupervised attempts to, to capture this anomaly. And I'm gonna do it through the lens of MLflow so we can actually see how uh, this technology can work in our favor for experiment tracking. So what I'm using is a pretty out of the box detector from scikit-learn called a local outlier factor, um, LOF detection, if you may be familiar. This basically sort of computes the density of neighboring points in a time series and um, uh, will check their deviation relative to their, to their neighborhood. And if the deviation is significant enough, we get a higher score for an outlier factor and then we're more likely to tag those data points as anomalous. Um, so if you know the kind of machine learning breakdown of tasks, this is an unsupervised learning approach. We don't have gold labels as to what constitutes real anomaly or not. And this is a kind of key, uh, I don't wanna say setback, but a consideration you need to make when you're doing anomaly detection is this fact that, you know, most of the, um, most of the tasks that you can configure at least at the beginning are gonna be unsupervised. You have to do a bit of kind of hard thinking to guarantee that, uh, that you can, you can leverage those results in a positive way. So I just fit to my data with this uh, local outlier factor. I'm using 10 neighbors um, on, a, on a train set of around 50 data points. And if I can just highlight, there's one outlier factor that stands out. Uh, the threshold, if you don't change the kind of vanilla scikit-learn um, configuration is a 1.5, absolute value 1.5 for a detection. So um, we've got one point eclipsing that. And actually, if I use some, some plotly to add a vertical line where that um, integer is located, the one that, that returns positive for the predictions, um, well, negative, actually, it'll return minus one if we get an anomaly. Yeah, I've got a single anomaly here. Um, and that's great. You know, we, we figured out that we can partition our, our, uh, our set of data points into kind of standard and non-standard points. Um, if we were doing this in, in a production setting and we had actually grabbed the latest 50 data points from this table, run a sort of anomaly detection on it, and then surface to this particular result, then we could think about you know, setting up some notification routing to dump this anomaly into another table or um, some event log somewhere where we could maybe send an email or push a Slack notification or something to alert our engineers to the fact that the table is out of date at this point in time. And what I want to get into, I'm going to, I'm going to show the ML flow stuff in just a second, but I also want to indicate kind of the setbacks that of using this such a naive attempt. Um, LOF is, uh, I mean, it's, it's good in massive data settings uh, for certain, um, certain tasks because it actually scales quite nicely. It has good complexity, but um, it's not the right detection algorithm for our particular case here. For one, um, you know, the threshold for detection is in, it's bi-directional, which would mean that if one of these small updates down here was uh, too small, we'd be issuing an alert for that, uh, for that point. And that's obviously not what we want. We don't really care if our table updates so close together in time, unless you have like a particular use case that would make such a such an instance relevant. Um, also, we're only passing in the delay information. We have sort of a kind of a, a singular one dimensional vector as our feature set. Um, I've ignored all of the fancy and interesting stuff you can do around seasonality. So there's there's um, no auto regression, no rolling average, uh, exponential smoothing, uh, kind of seasonality prediction, any of the stuff that you might have heard about if you know time series anomaly detection whole winters and what have you. 
Um, you can do that stuff here if, you, if you'd like to. Um, and uh, there's a lot of features at your disposal, even from just pulling the, the measurement timestamp and the kind of splitting the date time of the, the update time uh, in, intelligibly. So uh, we could do a lot better with that. And I'd encourage you to think about the limitations and sort of uh, think about what the best anomaly approach towards this uh, particular task would be. Um, but just in my sort of last couple of uh, last couple of minutes in the technical demo, I want to show what MLflow had been doing after I had configured my auto log here. And um, the representation is a bit uh, a bit lacking, given that the task is unsupervised. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, here's my latest experiment run. You can see uh, at 9:35 Pacific time. Uh, if I wanted to, I could restore the notebook to the state where that model had been run. I'm, I'm not going to do that because it's identical, but I can look at what the experiment looks like. Um, it took 3.7 seconds to train. It's finished. And then I can actually look at the parameters I used for this model instance. So I can check that my LOF leaf size was 30. I used 10 neighbors. Um, and P equals 2 means I was using a Euclidean distance metric instead of Manhattan. So if you're interested in sort of those hyperparameter tuning questions, that would be sort of how you would uh, how you'd get that. Um, you'll also notice, actually, I think if I go back to my um, code, we may surface a warning at some point about the fact that, yeah, because uh, we're running unsupervised, we don't have training labels. And as a result, all of the kind of nice out of the box training metric uh, tracking and, and accuracy tracking that MLflow provides is uh, not available for us. And um, I'll actually go back to the slides to explain why that's an interesting thing. Um, so I'm gonna go back into the, the presentation here, but um, do people have any questions in the meantime? Oh, sure. There are actually a whole bunch of questions that actually have uh, popped up uh, since there. So let me Great. go ahead and, and uh, try to chime in on some of them in that case. Okay. Um, yeah, sounds good. Uh, for starters, uh, from logistically, uh, will the no notebooks and the slides be made available? Uh, we've already responded in the various forms that we will prop them up to the YouTube channel. There is a request to us email it out as well. I I'm not, I'm a little concerned that we might be spamming folks, so we might not do that, but I'll, I'll talk to uh, Rachel and Karen to figure out what the right approach is for something like this. Uh, but we will definitely be uh, uh, excuse me, propping it up to the YouTube channel so that way you can see it from there. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, uh, there is an earlier question for, uh, concerning the data lineage graph uh, that was uh, that Partik had shown. It's like, how do you go create that? And so I guess that's the first question right there. So. Partik, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, sure. So the very cool thing is if you're using Delta Live Tables, it's created for you. You don't really have to do anything. It's just built out of the box from Databricks, and you, you can just get it through there. If you're not using Databricks, there's a lot of open source options and plug Monte Carlo as well. A bunch of other different ways to build lineage out there. Does that answer what you? Does that? Yeah, no, I think it does. Yes, and, and for everybody, uh, I'm looking at LinkedIn, YouTube, and Zoom, so I'm trying to compile the questions together. So, do me a favor if it's not if we didn't answer, it's not on purpose. Just chime in again, and we'll we'll continue to follow up. Okay, uh, so that's the first question. Next question. Um, uh, okay, um, let's see. Also. Would you be able to throw some light into how you see the changes in the, the query log changes? Where there's some specific uh, option available right here in Databricks, I'll actually just answer that question right now. Uh, in terms of seeing the query change logs, that actually is directly, uh, I believe it was during earlier um, uh, in the demo that Ryan, you had shown, that was actually from a, a Delta table. So the Delta table, when you saw you describe table actually contains uh, a snap snapshot history of all the transactions that were committed to the table. And so because that's all there, that's actually how you see any of those changes. And then there was a subsequent question, I believe from Malcolm um, that asked, oh, well, why don't you just use Delta CDF? That's actually a good call out. Uh, Delta change data feed is a cool uh, ability to go ahead and see all the changes, but at the individual data level. So every row change, every insert, every update, every modification, shows up in the change data feed uh, itself. But if you want a summary of the transactions that occur, which obviously will uh, often will occur with multiple rows, that's what the describe table will end up showing you, especially when you show the history of that. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, 
I think that's it for now. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Um, I did want to clarify, uh, and then uh, Ryan and Pratik, you can chime in on this one. This, this, these notebooks are not just for uh, uh, running in Databricks, right? You can definitely run this in other open source environments. So, yes, yeah. Not only can you, but we actually have implementations of of pretty much that exact thing um, using a kind of lightweight package of uh, SQLite to to spin up kind of a database file. Um, and in doing some scikit-learn stuff and some pandas to kind of manipulate the, the data frames. So yeah, you can run this out of the box on some like local Jupyter server, and there's some demos for that. Um, also that, that describe detail command happens to be a particularity of the kind of Delta table environment, but you can do very similar stuff. And the point in using that command was to showcase that, yeah, there, there are kind of, there's a natural way to surface freshness data from tables that need not be specific to the Databricks table format. So yeah, a lot of extensibility. Um, cool, perfect. Uh, I think that yeah. covers most of the questions now. Uh, why don't we uh, yeah. flip back over? Yeah, I'm gonna give some talking points about uh, some uh, some some more kind of like machine learning considerations, running this at scale, building out kind of an experiment uh, laboratory and, and and whatnot. But why don't we just uh, hop in here and, and then uh, we can we can pick it back up for questions in just a few minutes. So we kind of did the demo. Um, I, I sort of just mentioned two minutes ago that I think there are some uh, setbacks to unsupervised learning. Obviously in the big data world, you hear unsupervised learning gaining a lot of traction because when you have like a massive amount of unstructured data um, running clustering algorithms and, and doing sort of feature uh, exploration and discovery is, is quite a powerful tool. Um, the problem is obviously you have a, it's, it's not straightforward to compare the results of two unsupervised classifiers uh, to each other. So two anomaly detectors might disagree on what constitutes anomalous. And uh, if you don't have a good kind of like North star signal as to what you're trying to pick up, uh, it's hard to know how to improve on our naive baseline that we just implemented. And uh, that prompts me to talk a little bit about two concepts that are sort of interrelated bootstrapping and meta learning. So if you're familiar with this statistical learning literature, you might know bootstrapping is like a form of model bagging or ensemble learning. Um, I'm using it in a, in a kind of a more colloquial sense to refer to um, bootstrapping a process. So specifically bootstrapping a supervised learning process. Um, so unsupervised learning at, at a high level is, is basically taking data that doesn't have a gold label. So that no correct answer with the data uh, and, and uh, clustering that data into different sets that share common features. And that's what we just did. We just took data with certain features and put it in two buckets, one for non-anomalous, one for anomalous. And the anomalous bucket should be way smaller in terms of the size of the data. Um, supervised learning is different in that you actually have a source of truth. You know what the real answer to the question is. In my little diagram over here, uh, you can see the, the points are colored differently based on what class they actually belong to. And so that's not something that's up to the model to decide. That's a, a gold feature, uh, a sort of gold standard. And uh, supervised classifiers allow for uh, kind of much more precise accuracy metrics. So you can look at like the precision or the recall or the um, F1 score of a, of a classifier and see if it has improved on some labeled corpus relative to other detectors. And uh, if you're using supervised learning with MLflow, you can get a whole suite of tools that I unfortunately don't have time to, to get into, but that can uh, showcase how that accuracy has improved over time. In fact, I think if I just show my slide on tracking monitor performance, in this line graph over here, you're looking at the mean squared error of a supervised classifier over time and noticing that as it as it runs, it's improving. So it's it seems to be converging on a good strategy for um, for this detection task, as indicated by the the low error rate. So um, back to bootstrapping. What I'm referring to with bootstrapping is basically uh, if you have anomalies in your environment and you have some ability to capture that those anomalies represent real incidents in the data pipeline you know, a real event where some ETL schedule went offline or some schema change broke something upstream, um, consider recording that data and consider using it as a labeled feature 
when you're going about training anomaly detection models. Um, I know that's kind of a, a tantalizing suggestion because I could go into uh, a whole nother hour of presentation on how you would actually go about doing that and sort of tracking the feedback from your end users like data engineers who actually go about investigating incidents. Um, it's a whole other ballpark, but uh, something to consider and especially to consider if you're using something like MLflow and you have interest in building out some sort of scaled, um, oh, sorry, uh, some sort of scaled approach towards anomaly detection. So, oh man, sorry, my slides are being uh, sticky, but I'll sort of sum up uh, in, in just a few brief points. You know, data quality for lake houses can be tricky. Like Pratik mentioned, the flexibility that you get through all the different endpoints and data formats that are able to be manipulated um, comes at the cost of, of a lot of messiness if you don't um, govern your system correctly. Uh, so we provide the five pillars of data observability to give a holistic view, a sort of end-to-end -end understanding of data health and to provide kind of a natural transition towards knowing what actions to take when data goes down, um, dependent on you know, the, different, the different signals from your data observability pipeline. Um, you can apply this observability at all four layers, like Pratik mentioned, so based on the different um, uh, the specificity, the specifics of your, uh, your environment, you may be using the storage layer or the query log layer to pull certain freshness or size information that sort of depends on your stack. Uh, but this, this notion really is ubiquitous across the data lake. Um, and specifically today, we saw how PySpark with MLflow can help build and scale anomaly detection. And also that if, if you want to achieve sort of a uh, robust experiment tracking and improvement pipeline, you need to look at kind of supervising the learning process and pr uh, providing the ability for your experiment tracking software to, to compare the results of, of different detectors. Um, so we've talked about a lot, uh, I've, as I've kind of mentioned multiple times, unfortunately, we've got way more content to discuss that I can possibly introduce in this short time we have together. Um, but I will say, if you're interested in kind of hearing some of this uh, in, in longer form, uh, we do have some interesting events coming up. So the Impact Tour is a three city stop, uh, in-person events uh, uh, on, on data observability concepts. Uh, our next one coming up, um, these three locations in San Francisco, New York, and London. We've got Afua Bruce. She's the former data strategy lead for the FBI and chief program officer at Datakin. So pretty cool resume. She'll be talking about democratizing data quality, which is a very cool concept. I, I recommend taking a look. Um, and in even longer form, <laughs> if you have the attention span, we're putting together a book on these concepts called Data Quality Fundamentals, which will be going through um, not just the data lake, but the data warehouse environments, um, everything from ELT to um, dashboard applications, business intelligence, all of the types of observability concerns and data quality concerns you'd want at different places in that pipeline. Uh, so do take a look. We've got some chapters for early pre-release with new ones coming pretty soon. Um, and we just wanted to say thanks. It's been a, a real pleasure to work with Databricks and Linux Foundation on this. Uh, we hope that uh, it's for you guys is the beginning of uh, learning a whole lot more about data quality. And of course, we're super accessible for asking questions. Feel free to send us emails here. And um, yeah, I think I do have some appendices if people are interested in seeing some specific stuff, but I figured I'd open it back up to questions so that we can uh, close our time here. Absolutely. Uh, actually, one one of the questions that I, I wanted to make sure that people uh, that you got a chance to answer is like you, you've shown a great demo of running uh, uh, of showing of showcasing um, uh, data quality uh, within Databricks, and we've already answered the question of like for sake argument like that uh, that we're going to be attaching open um, um, links to notebooks to do this all in open source. There is a question though. It's like, hey, what what does Monte Carlo Data do though? Like, what do you what do you guys do? It's because you've been demoing this on Databricks, or you can demo this in open source, but people aren't so sure about what Monte Carlo Data. So I want to give a, a moment for you guys to chime in on that. Yeah, I, I can feel this one. So basically, what Monte Carlo does is a lot of what you saw was us kind of manually walking through the different components and a lot of the complexities that are associated around it. Monte Carlo's aim is to automate this for you and make this kind of automagical like the rest of your different tools. So we kind of it's like a data observability platform, a data discovery platform. So it kind of does 
all of what we were talking about and I hopefully a lot more just out of the box and it works on a bunch of different platforms so you can connect it to a bunch of different warehouses and lakes and different components and so you don't have to go through the collecting this data you don't have to go through processing this data you don't have to go through building your detectors and all of these things and setting up notification channels and building out lineage and displaying and creating your rca tools and connecting all this stuff monte carlo is a platform that kind of tries to do all of that for you and then give you the tooling to investigate and understand your data better by providing you uh different programmatic methods like you can use an SDK, you can use our airflow provider and you can do kind of, it'll, it, it just, it basically, it's like if you've ever used a, if you've ever used New Relic or if you've ever used the data dogs, it's intended to be that for data. I hope that answers that. I can go into more details like on a specific component if you guys want to learn like about a specific warehouse or more about like some of these specific layers and like the different components of them and how they're monitored and instrumented out of the box. Happy to do it. But the, the intent is basically it's like a no code solution. You don't have to run describe detail. You don't have to store it in a table. You don't have to monitor this and kind of build your own, own framework on it. It just does it for you. It's kind of it's the intent, the platform. No, that's yeah. great. I think I think you definitely answered the question. Oh, sorry, Ryan, did you want to chime in? My apologies. I was just going to say briefly, you know, from my wheelhouse on the anomaly detection side, um, we what I just showed was sort of a naive freshness detector. We have a whole family of models that we maintain that um, run freshness detection, uh, size detection, different field health metrics. So we track things like the null rate and uh, all of those models are sort of purpose built to scale to the whole environment. So you can sort of run out of the box anomaly detection that warms up in a couple of days. And then you've got um, observability across basically the entire uh, warehouse, for example. So that's that's my end of the pipeline, but Pratik can talk a lot about the different storage solutions that we implement with because uh, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, quite a cool tool, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually chime in one other point. Sorry for plugging more. Um, but basically, I think a lot of the complexities with lakes comes to scalability. We didn't get an opportunity to really dive into that, but that's I think that can be the entire deck because the nice thing about warehouses and maybe relational databases is they're relatively small in scale, so you can do a lot of these operational things. When you talk about lakes, you're talking about terabytes and petabytes of data, right? It's just, it's a lot to manage. So you have to do a lot of things to handle that scale. I think there was actually a question in the chat about um, how, does, how does Delta handle this? So like, for example, when you're running the describe details command, it actually isn't pinging your meta store. It's pinging the transaction log, which is wherever your blob storage is. It's actually leveraging the scalability of, of these like provider solutions. Like it uses S3, Azure, all of these blob storages, and it leverages all of that. And then the Spark engine to actually compute them. So it's like, there's a lot of really cool things. I'm, I love, I'm very excited to talk about them if you guys are interested. <laughs> Oh, no, that's awesome. Uh, okay, we still have lots of questions. We're trying to answer as many as we can. Uh, you know, I'm going to give the last question to, um, to Evgen from YouTube. Uh, he's from the Ukraine, and he wanted, from your perspective, Ryan, I think I'll have you chime in on this one. Um, can you explain the benefits of using MLflow versus just using, like, simple check rules on the data frames? And uh, I think that we want to differentiate between the data itself versus the ML side. And so I figure, Ryan, why don't you chime in on that one? For sure. Yeah, it's, it's a good question because um, you're, you're tempted to kind of meld them together, right? Because feature engineering right, exactly. is, like, is a, yeah. it's a complicated thing. Model tracking and experiment tracking is another complicated thing. If you want to understand why your model is performing poorly, it could be the modeling. It could also be the data. You know, garbage in, garbage out is one of the most overused phrases in like modern machine learning, but it's, it's real. Um, uh, that part of why this data quality concept exists is actually because if you're running a uh, complex production pipeline and, and you have really terrible data coming in that's constantly out of date or has high levels of nulls, like you can't fit well to that collection of data. But on the modeling side, I, I will say, you know, um, what I just showed was local outlier factor detection. It's It can run out of the box and scikit in like two lines. Um, in a real kind of machine learning context, you'll be running um, really complicated models. You might be like implementing neural stuff with uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. You might have like multiple modules of hundreds of lines of code to like actually build those models in, in kind of the specific time series anomaly detection case. You'll have uh, probably a lot of seasonality. Like if you're doing this for real, you would be uh, looking at things like monthly, weekly, daily trends and trying to smooth those in order to get anomaly detection that respects the existing trends of the data. Um, and all of those things I mentioned are hyperparameters that can go into a model. And so if you are building a model to kind of solve for that, you'll want to explore that space a bit. 
and say, what does it look like if on this table, like I try a much more aggressive seasonality smoothing approach? Um, maybe I uh, implement monthly smoothing, maybe I don't, maybe my training window is smaller or larger. All of those things are going to impact how well your ML can perform in production. And uh, you'll want an experiment tracking tool like MLflow to um, kind of look at your whole corpus of available detectors and say, okay, like we just made this change. The training window is five days shorter, but now accuracy on this benchmark data set we had is down 20%. So clearly we're missing some key feature by changing that hyperparameter. Um, sorry, that's kind of a, a wild answer, but the space is like, Pretty huge, and and yeah, you're right to point out that it's hard to sometimes decouple those. But um, yeah, you you do want both. I think you can't do robust production um, machine learning without both a, a, a kind of a good understanding of how your data is coming in, and also a good understanding of how your model is performing to that data. So, thanks for the question. No, perfect. Okay, we are definitely on time, so, uh, right at the top of the hour. So, apologies for any of the questions we weren't able to answer. Um, Karen, uh, Rachel, why don't you take it away? <laughs> Thanks, Denny. Thanks so much, Ryan and Pratik. That was awesome session. Um, I think you know when we get a lot of questions, it just shows that people are really excited and engaged. So, um, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, do this tech talk with us, and um, thank you everyone for joining. So, I dropped the YouTube link of the recording in the chat, and I know um, there were some links on the slides, so I'll make sure I get the YouTube copy updated with those links. Um, and then, uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, um, we'll just send a quick email with the recording and, and the links too, um, since we're since, since we're able to do that. Uh, with that, um, thanks so much, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.